You're listening to Episode 6 of the Bass Guitar Worship Blender Podcast. Welcome to Episode 6 of the Bass Guitar Worship Blender Podcast. For this episode, we've got four segments for you. The first segment being Playing Through Injury. Second segment, which is our main segment, is Dealing with a Keyboard Player's Left Hand, or also what I'd like to call Getting Thrown Under the Bus by the Worship Leader. And this is kind of a uh, kind of a deep uh, topic. It was actually a, a challenging segment for me to do, and it ha- actually combines a number of different stories, kind of mixed together and some different topics and uh, it literally was a blending of of sorts so it definitely gets the the blender worship blender name uh, work in there with uh with all that's going on in that particular segment so i hope you uh, listen to that one and find it interesting the uh, third segment is calling out note names while you practice this is kind of a uh, a, a goofy little exercise that I learned about and uh, st- and tried it actually for the first time here on the podcast. So uh, you might actually find this segment a little comedic, but it's also uh, an interesting practice technique that might help you out. And then the fourth segment is Brent visits a music store. Hey, Brent, that's me. And I visit a mus- music store, a couple music stores, and play some different bass guitars. And I kind of share that experience with you here. So of course, We know we love talking about equipment, so make sure to hang out for the the final segment for that. Segment one, playing through injury. This has been an interesting month or so since the uh, last podcast, and that it seems like I've been constantly fighting injury. Uh, the first injury I had was a blister on my hand, nothing really serious or anything. It wasn't like a you know first degree burn or anything like that, but it was a, a slight little blister that just happened to be right on my my uh, pointer finger on my left hand. Um, so. No, it was on my left hand. I think it was on my it was on my right hand. I don't even remember which hand it was now, but it was on one of the hands that touches the strings on my bass. So it was really difficult to uh, to uh, play the first the first time the first day I got it. But luckily that went away pretty quickly. But then uh, the next week for a service. I had a a actual splinter in my finger, and I know you're probably thinking, well, why don't you just take some tweezers and pull the stupid thing out? Well, I tried to do that, but the thing was so wedged down into my finger, I couldn't get it out. I even tried using a, a needle to, to pull it up, and all the that didn't do anything but just hurt. <laughs> so uh, I was like, this is you know sadistic to be poking at my finger with a sharp object, so I'll just let it come out because a lot of times you get those deep splinters and they just they just work themselves out on their own okay not a problem so i'll just wait it out a few days go by a few more days go by it still doesn't come out i play one sunday have to play without my actual it was on the splinter was actually on my middle finger on my left hand and so the i had to play like that service without using my middle finger at all on my left hand so that was a little weird playing stuff because I had to constantly remember, okay, instead of using my middle finger for this note, I got to use a different finger and sliding my hand all around. Uh, well, then it kept getting worse and, it, and that that splinter wouldn't come out and then it started to swell up. So now my finger's swelling up. We're coming up on Easter. I'm like, great, I'm going to have this silly splinter in my finger uh, for Easter and going to have a hard time playing. And it, probably about three days before Easter, it just came out on its own that's usually what they do is just you look down one day and you're like oh it's gone okay cool um so then the swelling went down i was okay for easter but well as the splinter wise i was okay for easter but then i ended up having some tendonitis issues flaring up again which i haven't had flare up in in quite a while so that was kind of a bum bummer and then i also had some some wrist pain too and on top of that i've been having some, some back pain because you know you're using a heavy bass hanging on one shoulder and, you know, starts to get to you after a while. And, and so for the first time in my life, I actually went to a chiropractor and, uh, was a little nervous about it. Cause I was afraid he's going to, you know, you know, start twisting me in all kinds of weird pretzel 
you know, twists and stuff and, and just hurt me and stuff. So uh, I was a little nervous about it, but my wife said, no, it'd be all right. She talked me into it. And he was a Christian chiropractor, so that made me feel a little better. It wasn't going to be some, you know, hocus pocus stuff and, you know, some kind of new agey thing. Um, so he's a Christian chiropractor and and uh, really helped out with kind of, you know, getting my back back in alignment, helping out with my wrist. Also, I realized I haven't been taking glucosamine, so I started doing that again, and that really helped out with my wrist. Uh, I don't know why I stopped, because glucosamine has always been a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. Um, so anyway, the reason why I'm, I'm bringing all this, this up is not to make it sound like I'm, I'm getting old and falling apart, uh, which that may be the case, too. I mean, we're all getting older and falling apart to some degree, and some degree will be completely, you know, well, you know, we won't be we won't be working anymore in in the in the flesh, you know. So we will we will be put together in a new life. But uh, for now, I'm not telling you all this to to talk about um, you know my agony and stuff. Basically, talking about it to say, hey, what are some of the the difficulties that that you have played through? Have you experienced some some really difficult situations that you've had to just kind of bear it and, and work through it. Um, love to hear what your your stories are. Um, my little splinter deal and some back pain and whatnot, that's not too big of a deal, but there might be some of you out there, you know, maybe you, you, you were in a knife fight during a worship service and you, you played through it. I mean, okay, that's, maybe that didn't happen, but you know, maybe you got something, you know, really cool story that you, uh, you want to tell. So go to our, our Facebook page, go to uh, facebook.com forward slash bass guitar worship blender and tell us about your story of having to play through pain or injury or some kind of situation where it was really difficult. Maybe maybe it wasn't pain. Maybe it was just you had an obsessed stomach and you couldn't get off the platform. Uh, you know, who knows? It could be anything. It could be funny. It could be uh, whatever your story is. Just let us know about it on the Facebook page. We'd love to hear it. Our main segment, dealing with a keyboard player's left hand or getting thrown under the bus by a worship leader. Okay, this segment is called, I guess you could call it a number of things. I could call it uh, getting thrown under the bus is one, or you could call it uh, when the keyboard player takes over the bass line. Uh, there's a couple different ways, uh, different approaches or, or ways I could approach this uh, particular segment. And it's also made up of more than one story, uh, basically more than one experience that I had uh, recently. And I, I actually took some time before recording this segment because I didn't want to do it right after uh, the ex main experience that, that prompted this segment happened because, quite honestly, I was a little offended and I didn't want to produce a a podcast segment where I was where I was talking from a perspective of offense because offense is uh, well, it's the bait of Satan. <laughs> There's a book about that called uh, "The Bait of Satan" by John Bevere, and it's a very good book. It really was something I wrote a, read a couple years ago, and I believe it to be true. Offense is what the enemy uses to divide us, and so I didn't want to have, you know, do this podcast segment from a spirit of offense. I wanted to kind of let some time pass, also pray about it and talk to my wife about it and make sure that uh, I was approaching this segment in a way that's non-divisive or as non-divisive as possible. I'm sure I'll still vent a little bit, but I'm, I, I'm far enough distance from it that I feel like I can, I can be, uh, I can have better, a better perspective on it and uh, hopefully be a little bit more Christ-like on it. But my goal here on the segment is to help to bring people together because this these are situations that I think are uh, hard for people. And uh, anyway, I'm talking about it and I just need to get into the story. So it's basically, there's two main stories here. And so I'm going to tell the first story and then I'll go into the second story, which is really the main story where, where most of the offense is uh, that, that I had to work through it in, in my life. I had to work through that offense. And so hopefully I'm past it. But uh, so let me go, let me start with the first story. They're both kind of related and you'll kind of see how it all works together. 
So the the first story was uh, a couple months back, our team was asked to do worship at another church, and the it was kind of like a little mini conference at this other church on a Saturday. So we went there. We didn't know much about what we were you know, what it was going to be like. We just knew, okay, we'll go, we'll set up, and then we'll we'll play our worship. We've got our songs here that we're going to do. Okay, great. Four or five songs, six, I don't remember exactly. So we go, we set up, and it's one of those situations where you don't have a lot of time to set up. You don't really know what their PA system is going to be like, if anything. And really, they're, all they had was just a couple mics with uh, with vocalists through the uh, PA. Had a, There was a drum set set up that we would use. It wasn't mic'd or anything. There's uh, Basically, it's just bring your own amp and, and play through your amp. So that's what we did, got set up basically just in time to uh, start the service, and I didn't realize that the other, the the house band of the church was actually going to be there, and they were going to be playing worship too. So they actually kicked it off, and they were playing, and then we got introduced to start playing, and um, so we did our worship set. But what I didn't realize was that the the house worship team was actually going to play along with us. and so they had a drummer, since there's only one drum set, our drummer took over the drum set, and a keyboard player and a guitar player. But their keyboard player played the bass on the keyboard with his left hand. And his amp was blaringly loud. I mean, it completely overtook everyone else else's volume. It was by far the loudest. And he was playing bass lines for the songs, but he didn't really know the songs that we were doing. He was just kind of figuring it out by ear and just completely just over drowning me completely. I couldn't even hear myself play. So I was trying to do the actual bass lines to our songs, not being able to hear them and just hearing this keyboard player just banging away and and trying to figure out the bass lines. And many times he was completely wrong through half the song. And besides, you know, if he doesn't know the specific bass line that I'm trying to do that has a particular groove for the song and he's doing something completely different, even if he's playing the correct root notes, then it just was killing, actually just absolutely killing the songs. And it was uh, a bit frustrating, but I just thought, you know, um, you be flexible. You're in somebody else's church. If that's how they want to do it, I just play my part the best I can. And that's fine. I can release that. That's, that's not a problem, but obviously it would have been a lot better if the keyboard player said, Hey, they've got a bass player. Maybe I shouldn't try to play bass on the left hand, especially when I don't really know the songs and just maybe I should let their guy play bass. That would have been, that would have been the kind thing to do. But again, that's fine. Um, their church, I, I submit to them. Um, so that's one, uh, that's the one, the first experience that kind of ties into where I'm going with the, the second story. And, and there's ways of dealing when you got to, I mean, our keyboard player at our church is, is pretty bass heavy. Um, I'm always telling them, Hey, you know, that you got to back off your, you're banging out octaves in your left hand and you're way down on the bottom of the keyboard. Just stop, stop doing that. <laughs> so we have a lot of discussions about that and there's ways, other things you can do like EQ in the keyboard so that it's less frequencies on the bass. But then if he's doing a solo part and he's got to use a, you know, the bass in the left hand, then it might be a little too thin sounding when he's playing by himself. So anyway, that's a whole other discussion there. So the second story is that um, we had a guest, uh, I guess he's a, you can call him artist slash worship leader slash pastor. I won't mention his name because I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I, I, anyway, I just, I'm not going to mention his name, but um, uh, so he comes in usually every year for a revival at our church. He's a pretty big name person. And I'll, off, I'll just say straight up, he is incredibly talented. So this is no knock or anything against his ability. And he's very, his preaching is, is amazing. It's, it's, it's absolutely great. So I have no knocks against uh, <laughs> this person and, and what he brings to the table. Um, it's just, here's what I had, have an issue with every year is that he comes to our church. He, he knows what he's going to play, but he doesn't tell the worship team. Now we're just a, you know, we're just a small town worship team, uh, people that play on the weekends. We're not, we're not professional musicians. And in the, in the, in the aspect of, you know, we don't, we just, 
we play at our church. We don't have other opportunities to, you know, tour and do all kinds of other things. We're just, we're just, you know, a small town crew of musicians. And so if you're kind of the big time guy coming into town, you would think, hey, this is a small town group of musicians. Maybe I should give them some, I mean, even if we were professionals, you still, you want to give us some material ahead of time or some clues some ideas of what you're going to do that would that would be kind to do and it would also help us to prepare so that we're better able to make you sound good when you get here Um, so it's a win-win for everybody when you prepare or you give people the opportunity to prepare when you don't you're kind of throwing them under the bus especially when we don't know what you're playing until you walk on the platform during service and walk over to the keyboard and start playing that I mean, not even a sound check or, you know, to say, hey, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the key. Here's here's the chords, whatever. Nothing, not even a chord chart ahead of time. Nothing. Just I'm going to walk over to the keyboard and start playing and follow me. Now, I just want to say that our church, Pentecostal church, and it's very much a um, uh, it's. I mean, preparation is always something that, that's been a little bit frustrating for me because I'm a very, I come from a classical music background on piano. I'm used to, you know, learning songs from start to finish and every little nuance of, you know, that's in the sheet music and memorizing songs and everything else. And so, uh, you know, our church is definitely a, a fly, fly by the seat of your pants kind of, you know, um, you got to be prepared that, you know, things are just going to happen. You got to be flexible for service. So I completely get that. And every service we always go off script. I mean, there's always something that that's a surprise during service. And I got, Oh, I got to adjust to that. Okay. Or, Oh, okay. The worship leader or the pastor is going to decides that, Hey, this is something that the congregation needs to hear right now. And they're going to play a song and I've got to jump in. But you know, when it's your own church, it's it's your worship leader, your pastor that you normally play with a lot, then you kind of know what their routine is. You kind of know, okay, the, oh, this is a song we played once like a year ago. I don't really remember it, but I, I'll kind of catch on. And it's not too complicated. Most of the songs that we do are pretty simplistic. Um, they're not very hard. So, and there's also, as long as you kind of know what the chords are, then you can kind of work out what your baseline is going to be and kind of go with the field of drums or whatever. And so it's, you know, it's, it's our church. So it, it's easier being flexible in that, in that instance. When you got an artist like this particular person, whose name I'm not mentioned, that comes in, he actually records his own music and has his own songs and a bunch of old time songs that I've never heard before. And when he plays, he is, I mean, he is all over the keyboard and his hand moves all up and down, his left hand all up and down. And he's doing walking bass lines and specific lines and breaks. And I mean, it, it, it's basically that's not an instance of of being flexible and following and you know and being able to say okay you know moving with uh, with the person that's leading that's reading his mind I can't do that he's got a very specific part that he's playing and anything I do is just going to walk all over it just like that keyboard player from the last story was walking all over my bass line trying to figure out you know what we were doing there's a time when you just got to go up oh, I I'm just going to sit this out. Uh, I won't do the bass. So that's basically my approach that I took this last time. I was like, hey, I have no idea what he's doing. If I can if I can follow along with what he's doing, I will. But if I can't, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sit down and, and not play. So that's what I did because every song he did was all over the place. And like I said, these were some really busy bass lines he was doing on his left hand. So anything I would have done would have just would have been a distraction to what he was doing. So I just said, hey, I'm out. I can't, I can't do nothing. I'm just going to sit down and indicate that (laughs) I'm out on this song. You do your thing. And, uh, there you go. So that was the approach I took. And again, I'm okay with it now, but at the time you kind of get offended, like, you know, Hey, I'd really like to be helping you out here. I'm up on the platform to, to back you and you're not giving me any opportunity to back me. So, um, you know, and that's, you know, the, the feeling I had at the time was, you know, if you're, leading worship 
and I can't follow you, then that's a problem. Um, and that could be a whole, uh, that's a whole other discussion we could have a, a completely other segment on is, is being able to lead your, your, your worship team if you are a worship leader. So it's important to be able to do that. And if you can't, then you're probably failing somewhere. But again, I realize that, okay, you know, this is how he does it. Maybe this is how a lot of other churches he plays. Maybe they all know his music. I don't know. But me personally, I don't know his music and I have no idea what he's going to play. So help, help a brother out here. So the, so what is the fix in this situation is, is kind of what I'm thinking is like, okay, there's always got to be, um, a, what's the proper response. So I, again, I think in that just sitting out on the song was the proper response. In the first instance, the keyboard player is playing all over me, but I was there to play our song. So normally if, if he knew the songs, I would have just sat out and said, okay, if the keyboard player wants to play his church, I'm just going to sit out and not play. But in the first instance, I kept playing because I was just hoping, well, maybe he'll catch on that I'm, you know, maybe he'll make eye contact with me and I'll be able to wave him down and say, hey, stop playing, you know, or he'd get a, uh, take a hint somewhere that, you know, he's being a distraction. But he didn't take that hint. And I just kept playing because I was just hoping, well, maybe somehow they're they're here in my part. And um, but I would have probably been better off just laying out on the first story too and not playing either so um that's kind of i guess the you know because i think a lot of uh, bass players get that type of situation too in their their, uh, with their worship team where they might have a keyboard player that just decides they're going to you know be the bass player or do specific like here's the thing too is like sometimes our 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 keyboard player our worship leader will want to do kind of like a we don't do it because we're we're not that kind of church, but he kind of wants to do like a shout bass line or, you know, like a shout song and he'll try to start doing a bass line. And it's like he's banging out octaves in kind of a, you know, in a manner that doesn't lend itself to what I would play in that instance. So it's like, OK, there's a song he wants to do a shout song, but I, you know, sorry, we can't help you out because you're banging all over the place and you know, walking over what I would do there. So, um, I think all of us as, as bass players have to deal with keyboard players that just don't know how to stay out of the, the bass range. And so again, what's the fix? Probably just to sit out and not play. And then afterwards tell your worship leader, Hey, you know, I, I, I would have liked to play along with you, but I can't read your mind. <laughs> and a lot of times I think keyboard players or worship leaders think that we can, and uh, we actually can't. Um, so, um, as a worship leader, don't assume that everyone's going to be able to read your mind and that they can follow where you want to go. If you're a bass player, be flexible and be able to uh, you know, hang in there as long as you can and play what you can. But if it's beyond what you can do and the keyboard player is uh, anything you play is going to interfere with what the keyboard player has already established and he's taking the lead, then just, you know, even if you turn down your volume and just pretend like you're playing, you could do that. Um, or you could just, you know, sit out and say, OK, I'll just let him do his thing or, or let her do her thing. Now, I'm happy to say since those two stories happened, we actually got an opportunity to play at yet another church on a Saturday for a a convention that that church had, and we had about six or seven songs that we played, four or five, again, I don't remember, but um, it was... It, it was a blast. We had a lot of fun, and we also had instances where the person speaking at the mic would suddenly start singing a song, and we had to join in. And again, this is a this is a, a an example of, of being flexible on your instrument and being able to flow with what a service needs. And in this case, it you know we were able to join in, and it took a little bit at first. Usually, I I kind of just waited till our worship leader till he kind of had the song under his fingers on the keyboard, and then from there I could figure out what chords he was doing, and I could play along. And again, these were it was us us being the the musicians to accompany the singer as opposed to hear somebody playing all the parts and we're supposed to play along to those exact parts and be able to know exactly what to do by reading somebody's mind. So you can kind of see the difference here in that this this, this situation, this last one, where where 
somebody just starts singing and we'd play along, that was fine. And that was being flexible and actually quite enjoyable once we kind of figured out what they were singing and the melody and the key and the chords. And, and again, they weren't too terribly difficult and we could just kind of flow and it was a really nice experience. And so really enjoyed that service, which really we, and we even had a, we had one song where we just kind of went into this improv thing. Uh, when the vocalists just started singing this improv melody and it was just, it was just, it was wonderful. It was a great experience. So I definitely don't want to squash the being flexible on the platform and, and just saying, okay, here's exactly what we play and we never deviate from this. But the more you prepare for something, the better able you're able to, to flex uh, from that when those moments happen, when you need to flex and, and be able to, to be, to be movable. And so just wanted to say that, that, um, you can still have those experiences where where you're you're being thrown a curveball and can still really enjoy the experience. And I actually look forward to more experiences like this last one I just mentioned, where we we played at this church and and just had a had a great time uh, moving with the Lord and and what the Lord was doing through the service and through us as musicians and through the singers. And so. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, it can be a lot of fun when, when things go in a different direction than what you had planned for. But if you had have prepared and planned in advance, then you're going to be prepared and planned for those uh, times when, they, they have, when you have to be flexible. So anyway, that's, uh, that's that. Segment three while you practice. All right, so I was listening to another podcast recently. I don't remember exactly which podcast it was, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was Jamie Lewis's podcast. He's a bass player, and he was interviewing somebody. I'm pretty sure it was Jamie Lewis's podcast. He was interviewing Joe Hubbard. And Joe Hubbard is a pretty well-renowned bass player, a very, very talented individual, and he really knows his stuff. And he he does a lot of training of other bass players, and he brought up something that it's really kind of obvious. It's when when he was talking about, it, I was like, well, of course, that seems like an obvious thing to do to be able to do, but. At the same time, it was like, that actually, though, was kind of tricky. And what he was talking about was being able to name off notes while you're playing. And that, on the surface, almost seems like, well, yeah, that should be easy. But really, it's actually it's actually kind of difficult. And he was making the case that, you know, he would tell students, okay, you need to be able to, to say the notes as you're playing them. Because if you can't say the notes while you're playing them, then you really don't know your instrument as well as you think and so I thought well you know that's a great idea I'm going to try that and see um how it works out now I this is I've never you know I'll be honest I've never I've never actually done this and it makes a whole lot of sense I might be thinking the note in my head but he's actually talking about speaking it out loud so something I normally never do, I'm going to try it for the first time right now here on the podcast to see how well I do at it. And uh, hopefully I don't, I don't butcher it and, and, and sound horrible and, and not know my, my note names. But uh, I'm just going to take basically a arpeggio uh, in the, uh, the key of A. Uh, just do the chord arpeggios, simple three uh, triad chords and uh, A, just to keep it simple to start off with and see how well I do. So the idea then is this. Okay, I'm playing my A note on the bass. And so when I play this note, I'd say A. So then when I play the, uh, again, I'm doing arpeggios, just simple triads. So I, I say A, C sharp, E. A, C sharp, E, C sharp, A. That's actually kind of, it, it, it takes some extra brain power to actually do that. So then you go to the next arpeggio and you go B, D, F sharp, D, B. <laughs> That's hard to do. So so going from the beginning here, it's a A, C sharp, E, C sharp, A, B, D, F sharp, D, <laughs> B, oh man, uh, C sharp, E, G sharp, <laughs> E, C sharp. I'm going to give up on this already. This is hard. D, 
F sharp. A. F sharp. D. <laughs> e. <laughs> oh man. E. G sharp. <laughs> F. <laughs> oh, this is hard. Okay, that's B. I'm I'm like, oh man. Because your brain, your brain's having to do two things at once. You're going to where the actual note is, and then you're actually having to call it out. So I was on the B, okay, and then back to the um, the G sharp, E, and then F sharp, A, C sharp, A, F sharp. One more to go here, and then G sharp, F sharp. D, <laughs> F sharp, I'm not an F sharp, oh my gosh, B, I'm even lost now, so as you can see, it's an extremely hard thing to do, um, and so I'm going to practice this, This, like I said, that, this is like the first time I'm actually playing that and calling it out at the same time, and um, so I'm going to, I'm going to work on this, because I think it's a great exercise that he brought up, and I'm going to work on this, and then a few podcasts later, or one podcast later, so, some some podcast later on, uh, episode later on, I'll go back to it and I'll see how well I'm doing on it. Uh, so I'm actually holding myself accountable on the podcast and I challenge you to do this challenge with me to get to where you can play uh, basically any scale, any uh, arpeggio or any kind of exercise that you're working on and be able to play it completely while also calling out the name. So this is challenge. Let's do it together. Let's see uh, how we look in about a month or two from now and uh, kind of compare notes and see, uh, see if we've got it down. Segment four, Brent visits music stores and plays lots of bass guitars. Last weekend, my wife was speaking at a women's conference in Tampa, and uh, she invited me to come along, not to go to the women's conference, because I obviously wasn't invited to that, but to uh, to have dinner with her afterwards. And uh, so since I had about uh, two or three hours to kill while she was doing the women's conference, I uh, decided to go and uh, visit some of the local music stores. I used to to shop in Tampa at, at Thoroughbred Music years and years and years ago. That's a a music chain that was in the Tampa Bay area, and it's long gone now. And uh, so there's not... well, you know, they've got the the Sam Ash store, which I think is what bought out uh, Thoroughbred years ago, and it's still a, a pretty decent store. Uh, you got the Guitar Center, which, um, you know, usually just kind of doesn't have a whole lot of, of options for, for bass guitars, and uh, there's a couple other few small local stores. Um, not like Orlando where they've got Bass Central, which is a store which is just geared direct, you know, just strictly just for bass players. Um, so in Tampa, you're mostly dealing with, you know, music stores that are geared more towards guitar. So you got a few guitar, a few bass guitars in the back, and and they're usually lower end models, and you might have a few little interesting finds here and there. But um, actually, I. I considering that um, they didn't have a lot to offer, I actually did find a few cool things. And the first thing that caught my eye, the first place I went to was a guitar center, and I saw a Lakeland bass, which you don't ever see at Guitar Center because they're not a dealer for Lakeland. But it turned out it was a used bass, and that explained why it was there. And it was a DJ4. Now, the DJ5 is a model that I've I've been interested in for quite a while. The only downside to it for me is that it's a, a the five string version is a 35 scale neck, and I'm a 34 scale neck player. That's just where my fingers are most comfortable. All my basses are 34 scale, so I've always been hesitant to go out and. Uh, try the DJ, uh, so I've never actually played one, and of course the only way to get access to one is to drive quite a distance uh, to a store that actually sells Lakeland, and uh, so I've never played one, but I saw it immediately, that was the first thing I picked up, I had to had to give it a try. Now since it was a four string, which I usually don't, I I haven't had I haven't had four string bass. My first bass was a four string, and I quickly sold it afterwards and and got a five instead. And that was over that well that was right around twenty years ago. So 
I'm not a big four string guy, but um, of course I wasn't going to turn down the chance to play Lakeland. And it was a DJ four, and it was beautiful white pearl pearl white finish. Oh, I just love that finish that they have on that bass. It's just absolutely a gorgeous, gorgeous finish. And as a four string, I was actually surprised that it actually felt pretty good in my hands. It was um, the neck was a bit thicker than I was expecting for a jazz bass, um, but it still felt pretty good, um, even though it was thick. But what's most interesting about this bass is that it's a it's a jazz bass. It's kind of a modified style jazz. It, it's got its own kind of body shape that's modeled after a, a jazz bass, but it's kind of well, you'd have to see it and you go, yeah, that's a jazz bass. But they kind of they kind of twisted it around a little and kind of moved some of the the curves around a little bit. But it's still a jazz bass. It's got jazz bass pickups. And the thing about this bass is somebody whoever had it who was selling it had modified it so that it had a P pickup, a precision bass pickup up right in between the two jazz bass pickups so uh and it, it it was a little it was a little grungy i'm not gonna, i'm not gonna lie when i picked up this bass i was like Ooh, was, whoever owned this didn't quite keep it clean and it had some awful i mean just the awfulest strings on it these were like pink strings i didn't even know they made pink strings but it had pink strings on it and these strings were nasty um, but I had to play it, plugged it into a, I believe it, yeah, I plugged it into a Mark Bass amp, a little combo amp, and I've always, whenever I'm in a guitar center, that's always what I plug into, and, and jazz basses just sound really good in, in those, uh, Mark, through those Mark Bass combos. But anyway, plugged into that, and since the original DJ4 is a passive bass, and this one was passive too, but since it's a passive, it has the top-mounted jack, you know, right on the plate where you plug in the, uh, your, your cord, but since this one now had three pickups instead of two, they had to readjust it so that they added in an extra volume knob for the new for the new pickup they added. So now it had three volume knobs and one tone knob. So they kind of shifted it down. So then where the you would have normally plugged it in, they now had a knob there. So they had drilled a a, a jack for the for the plug in the back of the bass. So it was a little bit, a little bit hacked up, but it actually, it, it still was in, in good, really good shape. Other than that, is just really grimy. But uh, I started playing it, and I started playing with the the volume knobs. Didn't really know which knob was affecting which pickup. I assumed that whoever had modded it modded it so that the the volume knobs were in were in alignment with the the pickups. And if that was the case, then the middle knob, the middle volume knob, would have would have impacted the volume of course of the middle pickup the precision bass pickup that had been added in and so turning that knob up and I just got the most wonderful sound now I'm not a precision bass guy I've, I've never had a bass that's had a precision bass pickup in it so I can't say that I'm an expert on it but I was kind of got a blend of the the jazz bass pickups and the precision at least again I'm assuming because none of them I don't knobs aren't labeled and somebody had modded it so I'm just assuming that that middle knob was for the precision pickup turn that up and I had some other blend of the uh, other pickups and and kind of adjusting the tone knob and I just got probably the coolest sound I've ever got it, it, it was just like I I was playing I went that right there is my sound I've I've that is the sound right there that I've always wanted on on a, on my bass now the it was a used bass. It was seven hundred ninety nine bucks. I'm not in the market for a, a bass guitar because me and my wife are building the house, and that is the that's the main priority. Until the house is built, we've got the down payment on it. We've got all our finances in control on it. I'm not spending a dime on on another bass guitar. But if we weren't building a house. I would have walked out of the guitar center with that bass. I would have uh, offered them something lower than the seven ninety nine, just because it was so grungy and it had uh, been hacked up a little bit. And some of the pickups, uh, it looked like it it was at least about ten to fifteen years old. Um, the, the guitar itself, I don't know how long they've been making the DJ line, but this one uh, had had seen some better days, but it still was in pretty good pretty good shape. It was just it was very grungy. But anyway, I would have walked out of the guitar center with that bass, and uh, maybe you know a few months down the road, if they haven't sold it yet, I'm gonna go back and buy it. Um, even though 
I don't play four strings. I've th- this is like the first four string bass I've ever had any enthousi- enthusiasm for. And then there was uh, another bass there that I, I tried after that. It was a Precision Elite. And again, I don't have I have next to hardly any experience with Precision basses. At that point, I probably have spent maybe 20 minutes with a Precision bass in my hand, and it's always been at a music store, and me just kind of noodling around with one. So this one, I, I, I once I picked it, it, again, this was the high-end model. This was the Fender Precision Elite, so it's an active bass. Once I took it off the wall, off the wall hanger, I realized, my gosh, this thing is like super light. Did I pick up the right bass? And I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, what's going on here? Is this thing like made of cardboard? I mean, it was just it felt really light, which that was the first thing that really surprised me. Plugged it in. I just played the Lakeland, really loved the Lakeland. Probably had spent like a half hour on the Lakeland. And so I started messing with the uh, the dials on the um, on the Elite Precision and started finding some really nice tones on that too. It had it and again in addition to being active, it also had a a PJ pickup configuration. So it did have a jazz bass and the bridge, and that really helped it out a lot and allowed me to get a lot of fantastic tones out of it. I mean, that thing was a tone machine, very flexible in all the different tones you could get. <laughs> this one was like $2,000, so definitely, even if I wasn't building a house, it wouldn't be in my budget, but um, I would have loved to have owned that bass too. And again, it was a four-string, and it didn't feel too bad in my hands, so maybe I'm getting a little bit more uh, comfortable with four strings. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I still prefer five. But uh, those were the main two instruments this weekend that I just really enjoyed playing and really give high thumbs up for. Some other basses that I found interesting, I played a Mustang for the first time. And one is short scale bass. I think it's a 30 inch short scale. And it looks like a little kid's bass. But that thing was pretty fun to play. I know a lot of uh, bass players like that bass and 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 use it in, in, in a worship environment so I thought hey I'll, I'll give it a try and, and noodle around on it and it was it was pretty fun and of course super light because it's so tiny so it'd be kind of a cool base to have but you know not one I'm going to go rush out and spend five six hundred bucks on so but uh, it's good to know that those little bases are are sound good so if maybe you know 20 years from now when I'm I'm getting older and and I can't walk and you know hunched over and I need something light and small to, to work with, then, then I'll get a Mustang then. But uh, for now, I'll, I'll continue on with full scale bases. The other uh, bases that were of interest, and when I made my way over to Sam Ash, um, the Yamaha, I really like, I've, I've been admiring the Yamaha B, new BB series and wanted to have a chance to play those. And so they didn't have anything other than the lowest model, the BB200 series. I think it's the 235, the BB235. And so I played that one. And now this is a bass that the four string version is 299. The five string is somewhere around 350. And that bass was incredible for the price. I mean, that it really was amazed at how well constructed that bass was. It felt like a much higher end bass. I I would have thought that it was a lot more money than than what it said on the uh, price tag. So if you're if you're looking for and again this is a a, a PJ uh, pickup configuration and a bass. So if you're looking for that type of configuration, you want a, a nice P bass sound. You also want a jazz bass sound as well. Something to kind of blend the two together. Man, that is a fantastic bass. So I highly recommend that. Even the the bottom tier uh, version of it is just, I was really impressed. I really liked it. And then I also played the Yamaha TRBX series. I don't know the actual number on that one. It was the, it was around $400, I think, somewhere around there. It was a five string. It had the active electronics preamp and it had like a a switcher a switch for going between different eq settings surprisingly that thing was uh, very flexible and sounded really good it wasn't something where i just where it was just like oh this thing's amazing but it was just it was a base where it's like yeah this is this is good and it can be used in a lot of environments and it would be a great kind of one trick pony to have for uh, if you're playing in a lot of different types of environments and you need something that's very flexible and can handle a lot of different things that you throw at it, that would be a great bass. And also played really well. It was just all around just a, a, a good, solid bass. It was something I, I 
would definitely see uh, somebody being able to use just full time for whatever it is, whatever kind of bass style that they uh, that they have in their playing. I played the Sterling, the which is the cheaper version, not the Sterling model, but the Sterling brand, which is the Music Man lower end model. It's not the lowest end. I think what's it? The Sub brand, which is you, you can get the Sub uh, Stingray, which is like what around four or five hundred bucks, something like this. This is the the Sterling range, which is around eight to a thousand dollars. Then you've got the Music Man Stingrays, which are you know now over two thousand dollars. So this was right or this was at least half price of the Music Man Stingray. So I played one of those, and that thing was really nice, good quality. Um, I would you know since I own two Stingray Music Man Stingrays, I know the quality on those, and this one felt just as good as any of my Music Man Stingrays. I wouldn't you could have changed the name from Sterling on the on the headstock to Music Man. I wouldn't have known the difference. It was it was that good. Um, the only thing I that the only real difference I noticed was the neck because they're using like a, a roasted maple and it felt a little different on the uh, the neck for you know when I'm sliding up and down on the base. It didn't seem as smooth as the the more satin natural finish on my base. Not that it was a, it was still a natural finish on this, but I just think that maybe the roasted maple doesn't quite slide as well, but it's still a very, very, very nice bass. So that was one I was impressed with. Um, what else did I see? Well, uh, there were some ones I played, which I wasn't overly thrilled with, but I probably won't mention those because I don't want to offend anybody. If I mention your bass and you're like, Hey man, you're just, you just totally just my bass. But uh, yeah, there's a few that did just weren't my preference. It wasn't that they weren't good basses, but they just weren't my weren't my preference. So I won't mention those. Um, but really, that's that was it. Hopefully, uh, one of these days, I'm going to be able to take a trip over to uh, Bass Central and really play some high end stuff and uh, haven't done that in gosh, a long time. Last time I was at Bass Central is when I bought my one of my music band basses because that's where I got it from. That that's a great place to go. It has just a tremendous amount of uh, of inventory of really nice high-end basses to play. So maybe next month or two or three or four or whenever again, once the house is built, maybe I can take a drive over there. It just, I think I've always avoided going there because there's always that temptation. You're going to find something that you're going to want to walk out with and that's going to involve money. So it's probably best just not to go to those places. So anyway, that was my adventure, playing some new basses and just kind of seeing what's out on the market right now. Is this how far away you were when you were talking? No, it was this close yeah, right about here. here is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't be shy, baby. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I'm your husband. Uh, I hear okay, you. all right. All right, so thank you for listening to another episode of Worship Blender podcast worship <laughs> podcast blender oh man it's even hard for me to, yes, to say our own name of the the podcast so i'm here with my, excuse me i'm here with my wife and we're uh, just giving you the wrap up on it so on the main segment babe how did how did i do on the, did i do okay was i, I too harsh was i <laughs> Well, I think you're just honestly sharing what most people struggle with, and I don't think it just applies to bass players. I mean, as a singer, I also know sometimes the tenors will sing the alto line, or they'll sing something that crashes into it and makes a lot of discordant whatevers. And uh, so, yeah, I think you were right on the money, and I think a lot of people would be able to say, been there, done it. Thank you for helping me know it's okay to just be still and not engage. So So I did okay. Yeah, you did okay. All right, good, because I was worried. I didn't want to, you know be divisive or anything no, I didn't think uh, okay okay but it was you know one of the things i didn't mention in that story which is actually kind of funny <laughs> is is that the, the 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 visiting artist whose name i'm not mentioning when he was banging away on the keyboard he actually did something i've never seen ever done before in the history of keyboard playing okay. on and again he's playing an 88 note keyboard mm-hmm. and he was banging on the lowest note 
of the keyboard. I don't think that was possible. <laughs> I didn't know people did that. <laughs> Me neither. I mean, even no. our even our worship That's a leader, That's even a our worship leaders <laughs> down there in the basement. But I don't think he's ever actually hit the very lowest note hmm. on the keyboard. So hmm. that was. Uh, impressive and scary yeah, at the same, same time, time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah we don't ad don't advise that but that was one of the that was one of the struggles i was having just so you know yeah um all right so um also i was i mentioned in the, the first segment that playing through injury so if if anybody out there has some interesting stories about playing through injury uh, make sure to uh, leave some information on our facebook page we also set up a facebook group just for y'all too as well so check that out you can go to our facebook page at facebook.com forward slash bass guitar worship blender and from there you also find a link to our facebook group page and it's a new group page so hey if you hurry right now you might be the first one to, to get in there and post something you can say i was the first um so anyway that's uh go ahead and enjoy that right now um and uh the segment on the the, the little crazy uh practice thing where i had the mentioned mm -hmm. note names while I was playing, which turned out to be a lot harder than I thought it would be. What's, because uh, you come from a music background mm -hmm. too, you had mm -hmm. music in college. What's mm -hmm. the craziest exercise you had to do as far as a practice routine? Well, my uh, piano teacher in college decided that the best way for all of her students to learn a piece of music was to memorize it first. And by memorize, I don't mean hand muscle mind coordination. Mm -hmm. You literally had to speak the piece of music before she would let you play it. Mm. So for example, I would say first measure, first chord, C. Starting with the bottom left hand note, C, E, G, and then the right hand, C, E, G, and that would be an eighth note. And the second note, and we'd, I'd have to oh, actually wow. speak the whole piece of music before I could play it. That sounds like it take forever. It does. It was infuriating. Oh, wow. <laughs> Man, that's like, oh, I don't even know how to, what even to say about that. That's know, just right? crazy. Oh, well, uh, so that makes my little note naming exercise seem a whole lot easier, <laughs> uh, more palatable to do, uh, yeah. or easier to do. So, all right. So, and again, I had the segment on the, the, the visiting the music store and, and playing different basses. So if there's some interesting uh, toys out there that you've played that you want to share uh, mm -hmm. or things that you're interested in, again, go to our Facebook page and that would be something else you can you can share with people because I know that everybody loves talking about their favorite instruments either that they have or that they're looking to buy or interested in buying. Have some discussions there on that. So anyway, that's uh, unless you've got anything else. No, this is a great segment. All right. So, uh, so I guess that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for for listening. All the uh, music that you hear in the Worship Blender podcast has all been recorded by me. Um, just so you know, I don't know, plug there for me. <laughs> <laughs> that includes all the the intro music, the outro music, and the uh, little segment <laughs> stuff in between. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So and. <clears throat> I was going to say something else, yeah. but now I, now I forget. It's but okay. uh, um, but anyway, so uh, again, sorry it took so long for this segment to get to your uh, ears, but uh, sometimes that's how mm -hmm. life happens. Yes. And we look forward to uh, the next episode. Hope you'll listen and subscribe uh, to the podcast on iTunes as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening. Bye. God bless you. Bye. <laughs>